Welcome to Snowy Range Evangelical Free Church. Shout out to our online church. We're still the church. We're just in different locations. Uh, and I'm thrilled that you're with us today. It was, it was awesome last week to hear about all the comments about how people were uh, getting together to participate. Some were in their pajamas, enjoying coffee. Others got together in their families. Uh, I think the creativity of our church is amazing. Keep it up. Uh, I want to invite you, by the way, to check out our new webpage. It's the same address, uh, New Look. And make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram so we can stay in touch. We want you to know that we're praying for you. We're praying for our community, uh, that God will continue to meet our needs and he will bring this virus to an end and that we can get back together soon. We are in a journey through the book of Romans And today we've arrived at one of the most personal of Paul's writings. I believe it's autobiographical in nature. It's kind of like he's giving us a a glimpse into his personal diary. And we get to the chapter today where Paul says, I want to do this and I don't. I want to do that and I do. And it really resonates with all of us uh, because we say, why did I do that again Uh, That kind of thing. And it happens even in our Christian life. The struggle is real. We feel that tug of war uh, going on inside of us, going on inside of us uh, to do what is right or not. And and quite honestly, this passage has made some people want to quit the Christian life because they think if the Apostle Paul couldn't do this Christian thing, well, I'm out. Uh, Let me encourage you today to read the whole chapter Uh, Because there's an answer. And so if you don't usually listen to the whole message on YouTube or stuff like that, if you check out, at least skip to the end because there is an answer. There is hope for us. And it's in Jesus Christ. So grab your Bibles and let's get started. Turn to Romans chapter 7 with me. Here's verse 1. Do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to men who know the law, that the law has no authority over a man only as long as he lives. The law has authority over a man only as long as he lives. Now, many of Paul's first readers living in Rome were familiar with Jewish history. They had some Jewish background. They were familiar with the law. The Ten Commandments, of course, were the focal point of that law. But there were actually 613 other laws in the Mosaic Code. And these rules and regulations govern virtually everything uh, in life. In these first few verses now, Paul is going to use an illustration from marriage to show why the Old Testament law no longer applies to us. Verse 2. For example, Paul says, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. The Bible has a lot to say. We know this about marriage, what it teaches about love and commitment, and that we don't take it lightly, that we don't give up on our marriages, that we work at them, how it pictures the relationship between Jesus and the church. We understand that. This is not one of those passages. Paul is not teaching about marriage here. He's given an illustration from marriage. It's a a metaphor. Metaphors take one thing and compare them to another to make a point. And so we need to be careful that we don't focus so much on the metaphor that we miss the point. Now, normally, we know that a man and woman are together in a lifelong covenant until one of them dies. And Paul is saying it's like that between us and the law. We're married to the law until one of us dies. Only the law didn't die. We died to the law. And death now cancels our obligation to the law. What's interesting is none of us entered into this marriage with the law voluntarily. It was prearranged. It was decided for us long before we were born. And it goes all the way back to Adam. 
We might remember in the past couple of chapters, we saw how we were included with Adam when he sinned in the Garden of Eden because he was our representative there. He acted in our place. And God in his wisdom knows that you and I would have made the same decisions he made if we were there. And we might not think that that is fair. We might think, oh, no, I'm better than that. I'm stronger than that. I would have done something different. But the truth is all of us have ratified Adam's choice in our own life by our own personal sin. And so the Bible teaches now that we are sinners by both nature and by choice. But then because of God's grace, we were included also with Jesus through faith. He saved us by dying on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin. And that wasn't fair either because he didn't deserve it. But somehow we died with him. We were buried with him. We rose again to new life. And because of that, we learned in chapter 6 that we have died to sin. We might not feel that way at times, but in God's eyes, it's true. And so Paul told us back then, he said, it is true, so now start to live like it. In this chapter, chapter 7, Paul is telling us that we have died to the law as well. And this makes a new relationship possible. We no longer try to earn God's favor or our own salvation by keeping the law. That's in verse 4. He says, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. When Jesus died on the cross, if we are believers in Christ, in God's eyes, we died with him. This means that our bond with the law is broken. You might want to write down Colossians Uh, chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. These verses tell us that something really significant happened in relationship to the law when Jesus was crucified. Verse 13, verse 13, it says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, and he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And in his final words on the cross, you can read them in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished, it is paid in full, it's fulfilled. And the proof of it is in Matthew 27, verse 50, when Jesus cried out his last words, this miracle happened in the in the temple where the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else, where only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies one day a year. This curtain was torn in two from the top to bottom in this act of divine vandalism. It's as if God was saying that everything that needed to be done for all y'all to come into my presence has been completed. And Jesus is the one who fulfilled all those requirements. So when we follow him, it's as if we have fulfilled the requirements ourselves because we are included with him. And God credits that. He imputes that to us when we trust Jesus as our Savior. Verse 5 in Romans chapter 7 says, For we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law that were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. This, This fruit, this result of sin in our lives is death. But the fruit of God in our lives is life. It's eternal life. But not just eternal life. It's a certain kind of life here and now. And we could sum up this life in two words. Character and conduct. Character and conduct. The character fruit is described in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, where it says that the fruit of the Spirit, you know the verses, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And it says, against such there is no law. There is no law. 
Now, the law doesn't produce and the law doesn't prohibit these kind of character traits. In fact, it has nothing to do with them at all. They're the product of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our character. The conduct fruit is in the next verse where it says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And it says, since we now live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. When we're in step with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, we now behave like God. We don't gratify the sinful desires of our, of our former nature, our sinful nature. So now look at, at chapter 6 again in Romans 7. Uh, verse 6. But now, by dying to want what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. It, it means that because we were included with Jesus, when he died, we died with him. Our obligation to the law died. We're now free to be remarried to someone else. We have a new commitment. We're united to someone else. And in this case, the, the second marriage is way better than the first. It's going to take some adapting. It's going to take some adjusting. We're going to have to change some habits, some behaviors, because we want to honor this new commitment, this new relationship that we have now with Jesus. Paul's saying previously we were married to the law. And, and by the way, some people think this is good. They think just living by the law is a good thing. Paul says, no, it's not. Because even when you do your very best, we can't match up to the law's demands. The law demands perfection. And the law never forgives. There's no mercy in the law. The law's job is to tell us how we have messed up, what a sinner we are. That's why Galatians 3.10 says, Everyone who relies on observing the law is under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything in the book of the law. It doesn't say do your best. It doesn't say, listen, if you want to depend on the law to earn God's favor, you can do that, uh, but only if you keep them perfectly. What it tells us is if we mess up even once, we're a lawbreaker. You break one, you break them all, close doesn't count. But when we're married, when we're united with Jesus, things change. At the end of verse 6, at the end of verse 6, it tells us that we have been released from the law so that we serve now, we live in a new way in the spirit, in the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. And so we're not just trying to keep rules anymore. There's a new relationship in connection with Jesus, and that is key. It's in contrast to the law, and Jesus shows us mercy and grace. Now, he'll still tell us there's a better way to live. There's a better way to interact with other people, to relate to people. But he does it in a gracious way. He's not condemning us. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. And all of a sudden, because of our relationship to Jesus, the obligation of obedience changes to the joy of obedience. The joy of obedience. Because we are now free to respond out of love and the desire to please our Savior who saved us from the penalty that the law brings. In verse 7, Paul anticipates a question. He says, what then shall we say? Is, is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would have not known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, do not covet. Now, some people think that coveting was a personal struggle for Paul. It could be. We're not sure. Maybe he chose coveting, though, because as Martin Luther pointed out, this is the covenant behind all of the other covenants. That's why it comes last in the list of the Ten Commandments. So why do we steal, Luther asked. You, covet, you steal because you covet what someone else has. 
Why, why do we lie, he asks. He says, quite often, it's because we want something, but we can't get it with the truth. So coveting is behind these other sins. Either way, Paul is making the point that we wouldn't know that something is wrong until the law said so. It's like, how do you know you're in a school zone until you see the sign or the flashing lights behind you? I don't know. It's up to you. So in verse 8, Paul says, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Have you ever noticed that when we hear that we're not supposed to do something, we start to want to do it? Have you ever noticed that? Do you know why it is? It's because we're sinners. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. We just just don't want to admit it. Years ago, the University of Chicago in my hometown conducted an experiment where they went down to... Uh, Lincoln Park, it's downtown, and they painted all of the benches in Lincoln Park, and they put up a sign, wet paint, don't touch. And then they picked a a spot where they could sit back and watch and tally the results of people walking by. And what they found out was that 82% of the people who walked by read the sign and touched the bench. We all do that. I, I remember being on vacation Uh, years ago when our kids were little, and we went to Yellowstone. And as we entered the park, and as we were driving through everywhere we went, we saw signs that said, don't approach wildlife, don't feed the wildlife. Well, we continued driving through the park, and we get near Yellowstone Lake, and we saw a coyote walking along the beach. And I didn't think that my kids had ever seen a coyote up close and personal before, so I stopped the van, and we were watching for a while. And I think that this coyote knew the drill because when I rolled down my window holding my sandwich, he started coming our direction. And wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden, the wind blew this sandwich out of my hand onto the road, and the coyote came running over for lunch. Now, I don't know if the statute of limitations is up for that or not, but truth be told, I knew it was wrong, and I did it anyway. The rules said not to, but in my mind, I figured the rules applied to everyone else. Now, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Because we all have times when we think that the rules don't apply to us, and we are all masters of self-deception when it comes to our sin nature. Paul goes on in verse 9. Look at verse 9 with me. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good so that the commandment might become utterly sinful. What this means is that God's laws are good. They are perfect. The problem we have is not with God's law. The problem is that none of us can live up to it. We love the commandment, thou shalt not murder But when Jesus came along and said, listen, the law says don't murder, but I say unto you, don't hate. Well, it gets tougher. Because we like to get even. We like to hang on to those grudges. We like to post all that stuff on social media so everyone else can see what a jerk they were. But God tells us to love your enemies, and we think he just doesn't get it. Anger and pride and lust, they're always there. And we say that just doesn't make sense. I bet that many of you have policies or rules at work or at school. And you think they're dumb. And you think, because I think they're dumb, because I didn't get to participate in crafting them, I'm just going to ignore them. 
That's just the way that we are. So our problem isn't with the law, it's with us. And it's because the law is really like a mirror. And when we look at it closely, it reveals to us every blemish, every stain on our character. And we realize that we cannot live up to God's standards. But that's what it's for. It's not meant to be used as a microscope to examine other people's lives. It's meant for us to examine our own life. So the law is good. It does its job. It shows how far we've missed the mark. It points out our sin. The the law wasn't given to us to make us better by keeping some of it. The law was given to show that we weren't keeping all of it so that we would admit that we're in trouble. And so Paul is reminding us that we are not under the law, even though it was good, because it reflects the God who is perfect and gave it to us. The law cannot save us. All it can do is show us that we are not perfect and we need someone else to rescue us. And that's the introduction to this chapter. We died to the law. But then Paul says, let's take a trip to Realville. He says, even though the power of sin over us has been broken, even though the law has been fulfilled, even though we will see later in Romans that we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we still struggle. The things we don't want to do, we do. The things that we do want to do, we don't. And you know what? I saw someone like that this morning when I looked in the mirror. And when you got up, you saw someone too. Verse 14, it says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And this verse, by the way, is what makes many people think that Paul is writing about non-Christians or a time in his life when he, before he became a believer in Jesus. I think he's talking about Christians Because even if we are a believer, if we don't abide in Jesus, if we don't stay close to Jesus, we're sold out as slaves to sin in the sense that our sinful nature can still take over. And if we won't admit that, we probably don't pray. We probably don't submit to his leading through the Holy Spirit. We probably don't seek his help day by day. Verse 15, here's that famous verse. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. It means if I know I shouldn't be doing something, I must agree that it's, law, it's wrong. The law is right. I should not covet. I should not steal. I should not lie. But man, oh man, it sure is hard sometimes, isn't it? We have to admit that in life. I have to admit that in life. You have to admit that in life. It's sometimes hard. If we don't understand that, if we don't admit it, we are not going to seek the Lord's help on a daily basis. And we need his help every day, all of us, because all of us are as capable of sin as anyone. We need to admit that. Verse 17. Verse 17. Paul says, as it is, is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And what Paul is doing is basically saying out loud the question that all of us Christians wonder about. And the question is, now that I become a Christian, now that I have new life and I want to be different, why is it that I keep messing up? If we can admit that we still struggle, we're on the first step on the road to recovery and freedom in Jesus. Because no matter what the sin, we have to admit we're in trouble apart from Jesus Christ in us. And so people ask, how, how can I still, uh, how, how can I be a Christian and still have a sin nature? What, wasn't I crucified with Christ? Wasn't I raised to new life? Didn't I get a new heart? Doesn't God's spirit live in me? The answers are yes, 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 and yes. 
But the answer goes back to chapter 6. You might remember back in chapter 6, in verse 6, we saw a couple weeks ago. It said, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And we saw that that phrase, that sin might be done away with, that phrase, it doesn't mean to eradicate or obliterate our sinful nature. It means to render it powerless. It means that we have been freed from the slavery to sin by Christ's power. We don't have to submit to sin's demands anymore in our life because sin is not the boss of us. We still possess the capability to sin, the capacity to sin, and we can tame it. We can tame it somehow, but the struggle is real, and we will continue with that struggle until the day that we die or Jesus comes back. And that is why we have to remain close to Jesus. That's what he taught us in John chapter 15. Write down John chapter 15 and read that passage where he says to his disciples, I'm like the vine and you're the branches. Remain in me, abide in me, or else you can do nothing. And I think the apostle Paul here is admitting That even as an apostle, even as someone who writes scripture, he has to abide in Jesus. He has to allow Jesus to guide and direct his life, and he has to follow and obey. And then he gets to verse 21. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. And I read that verse, and I realized that I don't know anyone who has ever had to call a friend and say, you know what, I was thinking about sinning this morning, and I wonder if you could give me an idea or two. None of us has ever done that, because it's automatic. Evil is right there with us. Even for those of us who have trusted Jesus, if we don't abide in him. Verse 22. Verse 22. Paul says, in my inner being, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. And this is why I think that Paul is talking about his Christian experience, because a non-Christian does not delight in the law of God in his inner being. He says, in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. He's just saying there's a fight going on inside of us. And this fight is still going on in Paul. Paul was converted on that road to Damascus in the year uh, AD 35. And then he wrote this letter to the Romans in AD 57. And that means for 22 years, Paul has been a committed follower of Jesus Christ. He's maturing in, in his spiritual life. And he still says, I have to deal with and confront sin on a daily basis. Now, here's the conclusion. Here's the difference for you and for me. It's in verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He's not just talking about our physical body, but a life that is dominated by sin and death, our sin nature. Verse 25, you want to highlight this in your Bible. Thanks be to God. It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I believe that Paul's teaching us in this chapter that we need the Savior every day of our lives because no one else can rescue us, only our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In order for him to do that, though, we have to admit our need. And when we do that, his great love is for sinners like me and like you. But he says, listen, you have to stay committed to Jesus. You have to be united to him because the old nature is going to come and try and get between you again. It's going to try and lure us back to the old way of life, make us slaves again. But for anyone who admits their need, there's freedom in Jesus to be and to do what God has created us for. 
let's pray. And you, wherever you're watching, you just add your, your prayers to mine. Lord, we know, we recognize now for sure we're not alone or unique in our struggle. Even the Apostle Paul had this. So I pray that you'd help me, help all the, uh, of those who are watching, that we need Jesus not just for salvation, but we need his grace every day of our lives. Help us to understand it, admit that, and cling to Jesus, stay close to him, abide in him. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea that growing in grace means getting to a place where we don't need grace anymore. In reality, growing in grace means a greater awareness of our need for it. We admit that today. We need you. Every hour, we need you. So help us to stay close. Thank you for your promise of freedom and power and the Holy Spirit to work in our lives if we do. And we pray in your name, amen. Thank you.